very lovely to see you all. My name's Ruth Mertens, and I am one of the two directors of this programme on, from the Hamilton Trust. Hamilton Trust is a small, very small, educational charity, and our only aim is to help teachers teach and pupils learn. Um, we mainly are focused almost 100% on primary. This is a kind of departure for us into secondary, but last year we piloted this programme with the wonderfully kind assistance of the Oxford Academy and Cheney <coughs> and Carterton School in West Oxfordshire and Oakhampton School on Dartmoor in Devon. And so those four schools piloted this programme. As a result of the feedback that we got from those schools, we rewrote the programme and produced a new one because the feedback was very, very helpful in thinking what we got wrong and what we got right. We're now piloting it with about 75 schools across the country and we're really hoping that your feedback helps us to get this even better. And so, you know, critical comments are genuinely welcomed. We don't have any other agenda. We have no commercial agenda. And although we do work with DfE, we are not paid for or funded by DfE, We're so therefore any of your comments we just take. We have no interest other than making the programme good. Uh, the basic idea behind the programme is that um, numeracy, that is to say arithmetical fluency, if you like, tends to fall off between year six, end of year six, when everybody's been beep, beep, beeping at the sats, and somewhere around year 11, when everybody's pushing at GCSE, but currently you can attain a level C at GCSE with pretty poor numeracy skills, because you can focus on other aspects of the maths. Um, it won't be the case, of course, in three, four, five years' time that you will be able to do that. Numeracy will definitely, since the task force report, um, numeracy will be a much higher focus at GCSE level. Who knows what it'll be called then? But, and I'm not even going to get into that, but irrespective of all that politics, the fact of the matter is that this sort of tail-off in numeracy is a not, a great, uh, not great for anybody. And we were interested in preventing that from happening. And so this programme is really about keeping kids' numeracy simmering on a, on all the way through from year seven to year nine at least so that they don't forget it all. One reason why kids kind of forget it all is because actually nowadays you can get through daily life with virtually no numeracy. Why? Because what have you got? You've got your mobile, haven't you? And also, to be honest, everything's so automated now, you don't, often you don't need to do the things you used to do in the old days, I mean in the olden days, because I imagine a lot of people here don't, don't know, aren't old enough to remember the days when you had to calculate your change because it was real money in your real hand in a real, uh, with a real till, or even a drawer in the <coughs> shop. Um, nowadays, that's not the case. And also, memorisation is a big issue in English education. And the reason why it's a big issue, despite what one reads in the press, is not because teachers don't teach tables or because they don't teach number facts, because I have never been in a primary school where teachers do not hammer the tables home and hammer the number facts home. The problem is that memorisation is a big issue culturally in England. Now, that's not true of all subcultures, but it is true of quite a few. Kids do not need to memorise. They do not memorise routinely, they no longer engage in those ritualised practices that we used to engage in in the 50s and 60s when I probably, when I got to school, I probably knew, I don't know, 20 prayers and 100 nursery rhymes, you know? Not because I was clever, because I wasn't, and certainly not because I was holy, because I definitely wasn't, but because everyone did. It was just what happened. And so memorisation was just a part of the culture. Now, there are kids who are still memorising in those sorts of ways from being knee-high to a grasshopper up. But most of the kids in the schools that I, we specifically work in are not engaged in those sort of practices. So I'll give you an example. When I ask my GCSE maths group to give me their mobile numbers, they all take out their mobiles and click them on to give me the number. Do you see what I mean? It's routine for them. I say, don't you know your numbers? Well, why, why would I? Don't need to know my number. Why would I? You know, here it is. You want it or not? You know, it's simple. Now, if we think about it honestly, <coughs> how many of you guys 
actually know more than three no mobile numbers? Oh, you see your maths teachers, you're not typical. That's four or five in the, in the group. A lot of us don't, do we? I mean, we don't need to, do we? Well, you know, when I was 15, I knew probably 20 phone numbers. Why? Because you ran home from school, rang all your friends before your parents got in. So obviously you knew all your friends' numbers. You know, it was just how it was. Nowadays, we don't tend to learn mobile numbers. So the culture has changed. You know, we don't live in Singapore. We are not part of a Singaporean culture. Children do not routinize, carry out those sort of routinized memorizing practices. They're not sort of so... They're not part of our culture. Therefore, m memory is a big issue. It's certainly a massive issue in primary because you can teach tables really, really, really hard. You can really hammer them home. And you come back, and we're in this situation at the moment, and the year fives don't know their tables, even though we hammered them last year. And when I say hammered them, I mean did them every single week. I literally can't believe they don't know them. You know, it's beyond belief to me. But they literally don't because... It's hard to get children to really retain things in short-term memory. Do you find that too? Is, that, is this ringing true or is it very different in your... different for you guys? No, it's true. Yeah. Totally true. And so the other thing that means is that, for sh that calculation, mental calculation, requires that you hold things in your short-term memory. So often if you're doing a mental calculation, um, the example I usually like to give is that you're doing something like which to me is a mental calculation, right? I can, can we see that? 23 times 19. Um, I double it, so 46, multiply by 10, 460, and I have to take off the 23. Now, in order to do that, I have to be able to hold those numbers in my short-term memory. And what I find with m the 15-year-olds that I work with is they cannot hold those numbers in their short-term memory. Do you have that experience? Is that, or is that, again, something? I mean, some the can. Sorry? The ones that need to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The ones that are on your borderline, <laughs> struggling down, they're the ones that can't. Yeah, no, I know. And I think that's not because they've not been taught, it's because memory is an issue. And I think, therefore, it's something we need to address. So our view was, well, let's have a go at 10 minutes in every maths lesson, just being a sort of keeping the numeracy simmering, just keeping the arithmetic skills on the boil. And that, sort of, that was the sort of motivation behind this. So when you get your sessions, and we send out the teacher books, which are little books like this, which are the three sessions a week, going right through the year, when you get your, your little session books like this, um, that's the 10 minutes three times a, um, a week, either at the start of your maths lesson or at the end of your maths lesson, or it could even be in another lesson if you wanted. Um, some schools like to do it as part of tutor group. You will then, of course, the, the, the teachers delivering the programme won't be maths specialists, so that's something you might need to think about. To be honest, you don't need to be a maths specialist because th this is basic arithmetic fluency. It is not rocket science, you know. But the person would have to be confident in, in, in delivering this. So that's a factor. Um, it, it is normal, normally the case, that it's three times a week in a maths lesson. And it takes up a space in the maths lesson. Last year, Oakhampton did it at the start of the lesson. This year, they're doing it at the end of the lesson because they said it overflowed <laughs> into the rest of the lesson too much so they're putting it at the end so you know actually as, as they said after I think their lessons are 50 minutes after 40 minutes kind of you've lost the will to live anyway so you know having having um having a line and saying right now we're doing this is not a bad thing so I mean it's up to you whether it's the beginning of the lesson or the end of the lesson um it could be either but it, it's three times a week little and often drip 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 all the way through the year so you've got no chance to forget these things they just kept going. And the reason we put the sessions together in sort of, that's one day, and you've got it there as a, as a sort of prompt, is so you don't have to think about each lesson, think, oh, goodness, what am I going to do this time? Did we do multiplication or was that last week? You know, that sort of thinking. You know, have I been practising just the same thing all the time or am I getting a good coverage? This is a spiral and it gives you a really good coverage of basically place value, number... 
um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, a little bit of percentages, negative numbers, things like that. Sort of basic stuff, just keeping it going. Um, when we're thinking, I, I mean, it, I, I love being interrupted. So if anybody wants to interrupt, that's wonderful. It means I know people are still with me. <laughs> so it's when people start tapping their watches, I get worried. Um, <coughs> so um, the, the general principle is little and often keep it going. We, shall, we also have a homework bit that goes with it. And we are giving homework. The charity is providing homework books free. So just ask us, tell us the numbers you want, and we will give them to you. Obviously, the teacher materials are free. They will all be free on the site as well. So you can get them via the site, and you can get them in hard copy. And just ask us how many homework books you want, and we'll give you the homework books. Um, we also have little numeracy packs, which are dice and cards, so that if you feel like some of your pupils won't um, you know, have those things at home and might need them, then you, we can give you those. Now, unfortunately, we can't provide those free, but I believe they're a pound, are they not, Alison, for the little pack? So if you let us know how many you need, if you wanted, say, 30 of those, just let us know. Um, the homework books and the teaching materials, obviously free. So do they need the numerous packs? No. They don't need it. Well, I mean... Some, sometimes the homework, a lot, of, a lot of the homeworks require that they do something and then they can go on to a game site and play the game. Some of the homeworks require sort of some dice or some um, card things. You wouldn't need it, that would be an exaggeration. But if you have some pupils you feel it might help, like a targeted group, then you might want that. If you have some targeted groups that you're maybe doing some extra numeracy with, to get the little resource packs for them in school. I mean, Oakhampton bought them for their targeted groups in school. I think that can obviously help as well. It's totally up to you because that is a cost. But we, you know, if you don't want to do that, that's fine. Um, we actually slightly subsidise them, so it's not like we're making money on them. It's just that we can't give them free. But we are giving um, the homework books and the teacher materials. Um, as I said, we are a really small charity. Um, and we're indebted to Mike O'Regan, who's the director of Hamilton Trust over there. Um, it is the case that uh, with when you're talking about numeracy, it's, it's, it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string, isn't it? But in terms of daily life and in terms of feeling confident with numbers and in terms of making you know, life sensible and easy, I always think that actually it is comfiness with numbers. It's feeling not scared and comfortable with doing calculation that really counts. And therefore, mental maths is more important in my book than written in the sense that if you can do mental maths, you can mostly have a go at written maths because you're kind of comfy with the numbers. Whereas actually, if you can't do any mental maths, you're likely not to be comfy with numbers and that's quite serious. Now, as we all know, the problem with mental maths is that actually, in order to be able to do mental maths, you have to have some understanding of how numbers work. And I always say the, the three things that underpin that are, one, there's, if you like, there's three pillars, or maybe, maybe you'll say four pillars that under, underpin numerical fluency or arithmetic fluency. Um, the first pillar is place value. Children who don't, or students who do not understand place value, how numbers work, are absolutely sunk. And it is remarkable how many of those there are. And I mean, I don't know, you know, how, how much assessment you've done already of your year sevens. Um, I've just assessed my 15-year-olds for this year, and it is extraordinary. I mean, I use um, five questions, and one of them is, can you write the number... 101. It is quite horrible how many of these I get. Right, now, I expect that in year two. That, to me, is a, a classic year two error, isn't it? Write 101, and they're all thinking 101. Do you see what I mean? I don't expect it at year four. I'm pretty horrified as it happens at year six. If it happens at 15, we've got a major problem. Um, I, the second question I say is, what is 3.4 times 10? I expect you can all tell me the answer I will get. What do you think a lot of them write? 3.40. Yeah, absolutely. Bingo. 
What's wrong with that, miss? Nothing wrong with that, is there? Why? Because when you multiply by 10, we all know what you do. Yeah, you add a zero. So, you know, wonderful. Um, I say, what is 10 less than 10,000? Well, that produces some nice, interesting answers. Oh, we all get a bit tangled there. You know, it's often 9,000. That's quite a good one. A lot of them put 9,900. That's another quite good one. It's an interesting one to ask the kids. But it's surprising that ones I think are quite good get it wrong. It is surprising how, comp you know, how place value, you really start seeing what kids do and don't understand. And the final one I give them, I've discussed this before with Chris, is 0.2 times 0.2. And, of course, what do they all art write? Yeah, 0.4. It's obvious. And that, to me, is the most serious. Because if we've managed to get all the way through to 15 without understanding that if you multiply two numbers that are less than one, the answer is smaller. You know, and I always use the... I say it's a cake question. I always say to them, this is a cake question. If you've got half a cake and I want half of your half, am I going to get more or less than a half? You know, once you put it into cake terms, it's, well, if you like cake, it's really clear. So, it, you know, I think that, to me, <coughs> indicates a lot of, mis a lot of um, quite serious misconceptions. And it's sort of interesting. So place value is totally key to arithmetic fluency and to comfiness with numbers. So we've put quite, especially in response to the feedback, quite a lot of effort into making sure we're doing things which reinforce place value so you can see where the problems are and sort of tease them out. Um, the second sort of pillar is that children should have a really good bank of number facts. And that comes back to the memorization. And it's not just tables, is it? It's things like, you know, 67 and what makes 70? You know? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm looking at the 15 year olds going, oh, 67, 68, 69. I'm like, oh, for goodness sake, oh, away the, you know, can we not get this in our heads now? I know it's taught in primary. I can't blame the primaries. It is a fact that it's just fallen out of their heads. Now, it is after summer, everything falls out of their heads. So I do understand that but it's keeping those there. And it's also tables facts. And it's also translating a fact you know, like 7 and 3 is 10, into 2.7 plus 0.3 is 3. You know, those sorts of things. Kids don't make those connections, do they? I mean, that's my experience. So it's getting those connections on the map. The third pillar is that kids need <coughs> a sort of good mental bank of images and models that they sort of carry around in their head, so that ab numeracy anyway, numbers, are not totally abstract. And they're not sort of going at it like a guessing game. You know, you're asking me a question, I'm trying to guess what's in your head. You know, I'm, I'm trying to guess what happens. Do I put a one there? Is, it, is, is that what he's wanting me to do? I'm not sure. You know, it's, it's that sort of guesswork that upsets me. There's no model that they're resting on. Clearly, the number line is a really crucial model here. Obviously, number grids of all de description are useful models. There's place value cards, there's Dean's blocks and base 10 equipment. Money makes quite a good model for decimals, although the classic is write one pound and five p as a decimal. You know, I always get 1.5. So that's another classic, isn't it? But money does make quite a good model for decimals, although it creaks a bit. Um, so getting the images and models, again, what we've tried to do in the spiral curriculum here is reuse the models and images so you're going back to the same thing, so you're really making sure that that underpins their learning. I mean, it, you know, it should be in place, but it might not be. And the, the last one is a slightly... This is a slightly thinner... Pi pi this is a slightly thinner pillar but it is nevertheless there, um, which is doubling and halving. And the reason I include it is because you need it when you're doing mental strategies in multiplication and division. Because if I'm doing 19 times 5, I need to know a good strategy for that is to, is to um, do 190 and halve it. 
And that's, that, that sort of thing is useful in multiplication and division. Doubling and halving is surprisingly useful. <coughs> surprising how often we use it in multiplication and division mental strategies. So that's why I, I do include it, although I would accept that it's not as strong a pillar as the others. The problem with arithmetic fluency, and everybody in this room will be highly fluent in numbers, but the problem with it is that if you don't understand, if you have no conceptual understanding, then it is impossible. And so that the reason for that is because <coughs> if you're doing mental maths, you have to choose a strategy. That means you have to read the numbers. That means you have to know comparatively how big or small the numbers are. It, to make this point, if I do something like um, 63 minus 7, uh, 63 minus 58, uh, 163 minus 99. If I do those, put those three calculations, if you can just take one minute to talk to your maths partner who happens to be sitting next to you, you didn't know it, but they are, you're on your own there, aren't you? <laughs> Story of your life. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got, he's, he's got an imaginary friend there. Um, so I, if, you, if you can talk to your maths partner about just very quickly, mentally, how do you do each one? So if... Um, what's interesting here is, um, put up your hand if you used exactly the same strategy for all three. So first of all, the point is... <laughs> Okay, so each time you did, yes, a rounding strategy. Ooh, clever. Okay. If I'd have made that five, you might have had a bit more trouble. <laughs> Just a thought. Um, it, yeah, I take your point. It's interesting, isn't it? Because by and large, I mean, this one, put up your hand if you use some sort of counting on strategy. So some description. And this one, did you not use some type of adjustment strategy? i.e. taking off 100, yeah? Is, am I right? Mm. This one is going to probably generate the most diversity in <coughs> the group, in that there'll be those who are kind of wedded to bridging 10, we'll take three off and then another four off, sort of idea. A lot of people may know the number bonds 13, subtract 7, they know that's 6. The thing is, you're a very untypical group. So if, I, if you go stop somebody in the street and give them these three, it's really interesting what answers you obviously get, you know, in, in, in that situation. It's very interesting, you know, after three pints in the bar, asking these questions is quite fun. I mean, of course, nobody ever talks to you again, but it is quite, <laughs> it is quite fun to get to see the different strategies. Actually, in, in terms, the point I'm trying to make is that actually in order to do these, you have to understand some things about numbers. You have to understand the comparison, which ones are, you know, where they are on the number line, what's going to be a useful strategy, the fact that this is nearly 100, etc. And if you don't, you are, you are, you know, you really are completely stuck. So the foot underpinning numerical fluency is the ability to do mental maths and underpinning that is conceptual understanding. Written maths, of course, one can do by rote, but there's a problem with that because a lot of people say to me, they say, well, hang on, you know, in the good old days, we just learned these things. We didn't mess about with having to understand them. That's a load of rubbish. We just learned them. Well, first of all, actually, <coughs> a lot of people didn't. So the 50s may sound like it was great. It actually wasn't. And most adults in the 50s couldn't do numeracy. So let's just think about that. And even in the really good old days when we all did our 11 pluses, actually, you know, even in Bristol, I was lucky, I was in Bristol, that, that had the highest part, that had the most got through in the country, it was 20%. You know, if you happened to be in Brighton, it was 11%, bad news. If you happened to be in Bristol, it was 20, do you see what I mean? I was lucky, I was in Bristol. Um, you know, yes, and we all did our 11 plus, and those that passed got a bike, and those that didn't, didn't, you know, that's how it was. I did pass and didn't get a bike. I've been resenting it ever since. But the fact of the matter is that actually, you have to remember the percentages were small. You know, what about the 80% who didn't pass? You know, the percentages were small. Nowadays, if you got 20%, if your target was 20%, you probably wouldn't be sitting here, would you? You'd be thinking, <laughs> that's easy, you know? The 
the percentages were small who succeeded. They weren't large. We're now looking at large, but you know, your targets are probably, I don't know, or a to C, five A to C targets up, but I'm, I'm, you know, they're more than 20%, aren't they? See, you know, so it's interesting. Um, the, 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 um, the fact is that actually here, although, although we want children to be able to do the mental math, in order to get them to do that, we have to put, as it were, that, I suppose we have to put that um, in place that they can juggle the numbers. That's probably the best way of looking at it. And what we do is we take some, what I call default modes. So... If I take addition, I'm going to go very swiftly through the four operations. If I take addition, in doing mental addition, what do we need? Well, we basically need case value and number facts. Because I don't want this... to be... I don't want that to be a written addition. It may be big numbers, but it's not a written addition, is it? <coughs> That should be no harder to the child than 24 and 12. Do you agree? And even if I change it and make it... That should be no harder. Would you agree about that? So those are mental additions. Why? Because if I understand place value, I'm dealing with a number of thousands. And if I understand... If I have good number facts, 12 and 24 is 36... They're easy. They're really easy. Similarly, I want this. I want that to be a mental calculation. Now, it's not necessarily the case that kids will recognise the bond, although it's wonderful if they do, but I certainly want them to recognise that 84 and 16 is something I can do in my head. And that that calculation is one that, you know, isn't... It, I don't need to put the column addition out for. Because I don't really want them doing a column addition for something like this. Now, getting, getting to that, I need these two things. That's the basis of it. And if these two things are in place, these won't be difficult. If they're not in place, they'll be very difficult. And also, a lot of children go for the column addition because they're a bit scared. So actually practising the mental fluency is very useful because it stops them going for the column addition and also helps keep their short-term memory sort of, you know, you sort of use it or lose it. If you don't keep your short-term memory honed, if you don't keep using it, you lose it. In subtraction, the same is true, but it's even more serious. So this question completely flawed nine-year-olds in Britain some nine years ago, when it was one of the international test questions. And the reason it flawed them, sorry, 2003 minus five, the reason it flawed them is because they all wrote it up as a written subtraction. And once you write that as a written subtraction, you're really on to a hiding to nothing. You're going to have a lot of borrowing here. It's not going to be very successful. In fact, it's not a subtraction question, is it? It's a place value question, basically. That is a place value question. And so that, you know, that recognising that is very important. It's also the case that... If I'm getting children to do, uh, you know, if it's the numbers are big, so 12,647 minus 6,000 is another mental subtraction. And it's a mental subtraction because the numbers are pretty friendly. And if I understand my place value, I should be able to do it mentally. And my view is, and I always say this to kids, you can do it mentally if the numbers are friendly, that is, they're not difficult, and you understand how numbers work. Those two things have to be true. And then you can do it mentally. In the programme, we go for the idea that we want a default mode that they can use. 
So nobody can't do a calculation. Everyone can do one. And when it comes to addition, then it's pretty easy. You use place value or number facts, or you use column addition. If the numbers are friendly, place value and number facts. If the numbers are unfriendly, column addition. Fine. When it comes to subtraction, the situation is not as nice. Because you can use place value and number facts for the mental subtraction, but when it comes to the written subtraction, decomposition is a tricky one. Somewhere around a third of kids have real trouble with decomposition. You probably get those kids because they probably failed to do it by the time they get to year six. Um, we tend to use complementary addition because I find all children can do it, by which I mean this type of thing. We call it frog, but you, you know, can call it whatever you like. In primary sector, we call it frog. We don't in here. We just call it complementary addition. But basically, what you're doing is you say, right, you're going from the smaller number to the larger, <coughs> and how many steps are you going to have to take? Well, it's wonderful if they can do that in one hop, but don't count on it, because sometimes that's going to be too hard, and we're going to have to do that, and then that, which is fine. I mean, quite often, kids start by doing the two steps, and then they'll whoosht, get the point. And sometimes they can do the next bit in one hop, but some of them need that. I mean, you take my point, it's a, it's a moot point whether how many hops you need here. But at the end of the day, that's a very easy addition. 222.25. And I've got my answer. Now, the fact is here that that complementary addition method, in my experience, all kids, apart from those with a statement, all kids can do it. And it works for any subtraction. And I say to them, it doesn't matter how big the numbers are. It really doesn't matter. It, you know, you can do this. Doesn't, it really makes no difference. If I have, um, even to the point that if I have kids who clock it and who get really, really keen on the method, because suddenly they can do subtractions, and they can do them really well and really fast, and they can sometimes even beat their friends who are doing decomposition, because if there's some zeros in the first number, actually, this method can be faster. This is the only arithmetic operation on which I can beat my husband, who's a carpenter. Mostly, he beats me because he's very fast. But on subtraction, I beat him because I count up. And that I think, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because if you're doing something like this... I mean, the way I will do that mentally is by counting up, because 507 minus 346, mentally, I know that that's 50, sorry, that's 54, and then that's pretty easy. And I think once kids get good at this, and they see that they can do do tell me if I make an error, because I'm famous for writing the wrong thing up on the board, not noticing. Um, if, 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 you know, if kids get good at that and they've never been able to do hard subtractions, they feel really good about it. It's kind of interesting. In the summer school I was working in, I had a kid who was doing this one, because I was using it to explain, and she would not have a bar of counting back. She was just not, she said, oh, no, 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 I can do this. Off she went. You know, <coughs> and so <coughs> I was quite surprised. I said to her, we, we call this frog because frog hops along the line. And I said to her, I think it's cruelty to frogs to make frog do all that work. But she did say he could have a fly at the end. Um, you know, she went and then... And finally, which actually, at the end of the day, was, was okay. She got a completely correct answer, 
and she understood exactly what she was doing. I'm not advocating this. I'm just pointing out that a kid who's been really stuck all their lives and has finally, finally discovered something that works, is not going to let go of it quickly. They're kind of like, I can do this. I know it'll work. I'll come out with the correct answer. Don't, don't confuse me with other things. Now, we do use complementary addition or counting up subtraction for subtraction. Clearly, you may have some kids who can do decomposition, no problem. Kids who can't, I don't think there's much <coughs> point in teaching decomposition again. They haven't got it by the time they're 11, they're not going to get it. And so you might as well give them a method they'll remember and can do. And then they're sorted. You know, then it's not going to be a problem. And when it comes to decimals, complementary addition is 10 times better anyway. Because if I want to, you know, 10 pounds and I have 3 pounds 99, that I'm spending 3 pounds 99, I'm giving them a tenner. I want to work out the change. You count up. That's why it's called shopkeeper's addition. Because actually counting up is the best method here. And it is exactly the same, you know. And then, whoa, to £10. And, you know, I've got my £6. I've got £6 and a penny. Now, I may not be able to write that down, but, you know, at least I know <laughs> what I'm doing. And so, it, 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 you know, it's a useful default method. Here, it's a question of making a judgment. Which kids... Uh, you let kids choose their method. My, my view is if it isn't broken, you don't fix it. If they can do it, fine. If they can't, we need a method that they can do that they will remember. And that's the key. Because one of the problems about, talk, about saying, oh, it used to be fine in the 50s, or we, when we taught it by rote, it was all better. One of the problems is that that relied on a culture <coughs> where memorization was very much part of what you did in a routine way. As we were saying earlier, memorization is no longer routinized. Therefore, kids don't remember things. Neither do we. Therefore, we use technology. Therefore, they won't remember procedures unless they understand them. You see what I mean? We cannot rely upon the fact that they're remembering things routinely. They're not. Also, they're not using written maths, written arithmetic, out in, out, out, outside the school. You never have to do written maths outside school, do you? You know, in routine life, you don't have to. You don't have to work out your change. It just it, it doesn't happen. And so, therefore, actually, they're getting no practice. And that makes a difference, too. So we're working in different circumstances to the circumstances that they're working in in Singapore or that they, we were working in in the 1950s. And so we have to be thinking, what works now? What works with my 15-year-olds who've all got their numbers on their mobile and don't know any of them? What works with them? What works with them is to give them something that they can pitch into and that they understand, because then they can do it. So in the spiral curriculum here, what we build on is using a default method. Default method for um, addition and subtraction. Mentally, use your place value, use your number facts. Default meta method for, for addition, column addition, fine, no problems there. Default method for subtraction, using the counting up. Those who can do it, use decomposition, fine. No, no problem. Default method for multiplication, we use grid. And this is now so common in secondary schools, I imagine that most people use grids. So if you're doing, I don't know, 356 times 8, would you be, would a lot of yours be doing the grid? Yeah? Do a lot of people do that? And <coughs> the advantage of grid is that it, brings out the place value, 350 and 6. And therefore, that I've always got the place value sort of sorted, as it were. The disadvantage is that sometimes you can get a lot of adding. And that is a downside. And there's an argument for moving to what I call ladder, where we, we have exactly the same numbers um, but we're, you know, we are um, lining it up vertically. The problem is that actually it's surprising that this, for some kids, is a lot easier than this. 
It really makes a difference. There are some kids who really find the move from the grid to the ladder quite hard. And so, again, a default mode, everybody can use grid. Some people use Napier's bones. Does anybody use Napier's bones? Or, um, yes, yeah, which kids really, I find quite a few kids really like that, which is another way of doing it, and fine. But it's good to have a sort of, I always called it a default mode. If you can't do this, you can do that. And so we do tend to have grid as a default mode. Um, I'm giving myself a bit of a challenge here. And off we go. Normally, the addition um, across is not too hard by the nature of the thing, but some children write it out in a, verti in a vertical addition anyway, and that's fine. When it comes to decimals, I find grid works far better anyway. Um, we do do a bit of vertical multiplication in the program, especially in the higher levels. So then that's there. Division is the big argument, isn't it? Division is a really big argument. Interestingly, uh, one, when I gave a group of primary teachers earlier this week this division, That really, yeah, that really stymied them. They were not happy about that at all. That's a really hard division if you don't think of halving. If you think of halving, it's not difficult at all, is it? But if it doesn't occur to you to halve, it's a horrible division. There's going to be a lot of little ones all along the place and twos, well, twos in this case. Do you see what I mean? And so that's where mental strategies, again, come in so importantly because actually that, that, that shouts halving to me, doesn't it, to you? But you're all math teachers. So again, you're not, you're not typical. So again, one of the things we focus on in the program is look for the fours, look for the eights. They're easy. Look for the fives and the tens. They're easy. You know, what, then there's not so many you've got to worry about, are there? You've got a kind of a mode you can do things. You know, and that helps. Um, in terms of division, we use the multiples. We try and use the multiples. If we've got 8 into 904, let's take out 800 of them first. Let's take out 800. That's 100 eights. What are we left with? You see what I mean? We're left with 104. OK, well, how can we deal with that? So we try and take out some of the multiples. <laughs> Well, I can, you know, I, I know that 100 lots of 8 is 800. So if I get... OK, well, supposing I'm not very good and I don't know my 8 times table up to 12 8, supposing I... Uh, all right, I'll think 10 8s. OK, now I'm in business. And so, basically, that, again, it pulls out the place value because 100 times 8 is 800, and it pulls out understanding. Because I'm always saying to them, well, come on, what's this? what is this saying to me? It's how many 8s, how many boxes, of, or how many sets of 8 cans of Coke can I get out of 904 cans? You know, and it's reading that. A lot of kids say to me, especially age 50, I, don't, I hate division, I can't do division. I would say, fine, I'm never going to ask you to do a division. Don't need to do any divisions. You'll have to do a few multiplications with holes in. That's a multiplication with a hole in. But, you know, I want them to see the in, that, that, that they are the inverses, that division and multiplication are inverses, and also I want them to see what division means, because I think when kids say, I hate division, they don't know what it means. They're thinking, I don't know what to do. And what, when kids say, I hate division, what they're thinking is, I don't know what you do next. That's always what they say, what do you do next? You know, it's that sort of question, isn't it? So I guess what I'm, I'm to summarise, I'm saying is that what we've tried to do is put together a spiral programme which has some default modes, especially in the, there's four levels here. There's stepping up and then keeping up and then simmering and then shining. In the stepping up and keeping up, we try and use the default modes and really go round and round doing different things, hopefully some of them in a slightly investigational way, to practice those skills. In the simmering, we take it that kids can do that 
And what we're doing is keeping them simmering. In the shining, which I, I mean, some people may choose not to use, that's for the kids who actually are, in year seven, good solid level fours or even level fives. And we've used a lot of investigational stuff there. It would be appropriate for small group work there because some of it's really quite challenging because it's investigational. And so in that programme, we've gone more for the investigational side. And so, you know, it, it, this can be used. <coughs> I mean, it's intended as a little and often drip, 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 keep it all going. But if you have targeted groups, choose the appropriate programme, use it for the targeted group. It's up to you. You know, it's really totally up to you. Has anybody got any questions about how it will run or any of the, or, you know, um, anything else, anything organisational, which I might not be able to answer, but my colleagues will. It was just the testing. Oh, very good point. Thanks, Chris. That's <coughs> excellent. Um, last year, we basically <coughs> were interested in adapting the programme according to the feedback. And I didn't want to do any testing. We just wanted to get it right. And so I was just really interested to talk to the teachers and a few of the students about how they felt the programme had gone. In this year, because we're partly because we're um, reporting back to DfE and partly because we're spending such an amount of the charity's money on it, we need to be a little bit more rigorous. And so, therefore, what we're going to do is ask you to do a very quick test. You do not have to hold up the program. If you want to start it next week and we haven't got the test to you, you can start it. It doesn't matter if they've done a couple of weeks of the program. That's not going to matter. But we give you a quick test. It's intended to take somewhere between half an hour and an hour. It can, the fastest so far that anybody's done it in is 10 minutes. But I have to admit, that wasn't me. And... <laughs> Um, <coughs> it, it, it could be it's 50 questions, so it's 50 numeracy questions. Um, they, they do it online, but if you don't want to do it online, we can give you a paper version. Even if they're doing it online, they should have a piece of paper so that they can make notes, and that's fine. We just want you to put the kids through it, so it's basically um, a half hour, 50 minute session that they do the test. And then we don't need individual pupil scores, but you might like them. Because actually looking down the pupils I've had do it, looking down their scores is quite interesting. It actually tells me quite a little bit. So it's up to you. But what we shall ask you to do, what we will give to you is the test online. You will, ident you will give the pupils numbers. We don't want to know <coughs> the name behind the number. But you'll give your pupils numbers, so you'll know that you know Fred is number one and Annie's number two and Fred is, and Harry's number three and so forth. And they will put in, they go in, they put in, the, the, they go in through the school, put in the school, they choose a year group, seven, eight, nine, whatever. Then they put in their number that you have assigned them. They do the test. The results will be emailed to you at the school, so they won't see their results because I think it's important that kids don't see that they. You know, they maybe got 10% or 5%. That's discouraging. And, you know, they probably won't do very well at the beginning of the year, at least some of them. Hopefully, they'll do a bit better at the end. Um, and then we shall repeat the test in June or July. And the result, we'll then have results for <coughs> each year group in each school <coughs> to see if there's been progress. We do not need individual pupil names. We do not need individual pupil scores. We only need aggregates. We only need the year group. See what I mean? So we're only interested in aggregates. It's a very broad, it's a very blunt instrument. But it will give us one piece of data. We shall also ask you to contribute your feedback, which actually will be far more valuable to me. Because it will tell me, well, is the program too easy, too hard? Does it work only with these kids, not these kids? You know, should it be longer, should it be shorter? You know, all those things, which is what we really need to know. But the test will be one amongst other pieces of data. And so we do ask that you do that. You can either do it online or paper if you prefer. It's up to you. Yes? So are you going to ask us to test them then at the end of the year? Yeah, June, June or July. So it'd be one test at the beginning, one test at the end. Same test? At the moment, I was thinking yes, but I'm now thinking maybe I will match questions and just change the, tweak the numbers. Though 
I cannot imagine anybody remembering <laughs> across a year. Because <laughs> to be honest, in testing the test, I've done it myself four times, and I haven't remembered the numbers. I've had to do the sums each time. So uh, likelihood, same test. If it's not the same test, it will simply be the numbers changed. It would be Is the it same. multiple choice, or do they no. enter the numbers? No, they actually enter the numbers. Yes, I don't like multiple choice. I mean, it's tricksy, isn't it? Well, we just did it for the cats. And oh. We just can't fix no. it, can we? Really? No, you can't. No. So, oh, no. They enter the numbers. Yeah. Does anyone in the room know how to disable the calculator on computers, though? Ooh, what a good point. Never even occurred to me. Mind you, you'd be very slow. You'd really be slow. I mean, you would probably only score a third because you would not be fast enough. And it would be very obvious, because unless you were very clever and dodged around in the test, it would be, and I'm not even sure you can do that, because I don't think you can go back. So actually, you'd I, I would say to them, if you use the calculator, you will fail, because you simply will not have enough time to be getting the calculator, <coughs> doing, entering the numbers, doing the, you know, I mean, some of them are like this, you know, 1,000 minus 2. By the time you've entered that, <coughs> you, you know, it's going to take you a long time, isn't it? Also, there's some fractions, which is going to be a little bit tricky on a calculator. Not on the oh, really? That's really clever, though. My goodness me. I think you'd get some points for intelligence if you work that. <laughs> I don't know. Does anybody know how to do say? We, well, I'll tell you what, we'll look into that. Uh, it's a Dan question. We'll ask, our, we'll ask our technical geek. School technical geek should be able to remove it from the application the menu if you ask them to. Yeah, I guess so. I didn't even, hadn't even thought of it. Yeah. Any other questions? Can I just ask something? And I really don't want to delve into something, but what worries me is by testing them, they've actually had a whole year of maths as well. So how are you going to measure it? Because you would hope that they would score better. I'm not. I mean, I'm not going to say, there's no way we can say if supposing that it was 20% of the year sevens who scored um, in, in September, sorry, that 20% of the year sevens scored, say, <coughs> above 70% in September, and in June, 40% of the year sevens scored above 70. Let us suppose that that was the, just for the sake of argument, that was the thing. I can't say that's due to the HSNP. That, I can't say that. What I can say is there was a gain. Between the maths and the HSNP, there was a gain. Looks nice. My key, my key, if it, my key is: Are you then saying to me, actually, we think this helped, <coughs> or are you then saying to me, actually, Ruth, we get that score anyway? In which case, I'll say fine. You know. Then my next question will be: Do you think we can make it any better? If so, how? Or do you think actually this isn't the answer anyway? You see what I mean? The point of a pilot and the point of putting money into a pilot is to find that out. So if you get a gain on the test, if we get a gain on the test, <coughs> I'll be saying to you, do you feel that was the programme? Do you feel it was actually what you did anyway? Is it more or less than you would normally expect? Have certain children done a lot better? Others it hasn't affected at all, you know? Those would be questions, won't they? We'll have plenty of raw data. You'll have the individual pupil data, we won't. But you will, so that'll be interesting to you guys. So. I know, I know, that's yeah, true. Have they retained it? It's going to be a big question. My feel, I mean, I don't know, my gut feeling, uh, after so many years in education, it's a bit embarrassing, but my gut feeling is that actually kids don't retain things over the summer. But it's like getting back on a bike. Actually, you know, this week we've been doing our number bonds again in the, in the um, year threes, with the year threes. Nobody could remember their flipping number bonds. It was seven and what make ten, <coughs> you know, with the whole class. But now they've all got them again. That, it only took, you know, a few days for them to remember them. That's because they were well taught. You see what I mean? So actually they've, they've got them again. I mean, this is just one school, but I think if you've really got it, it doesn't take much to remember it. If you haven't got it, it takes a lot to remember it, because you're not really remembering it, you're just relearning it, which is a different matter. So that's my kind of gut on it, but 
I don't know. I think it, we've got a lot of challenges at the moment that are quite complex in terms of num numerical fluency. It's not an easy thing. It's all very well to say, oh, you know, 90% of 16-year-olds can't, you know, can't do any maths. That's all very well. First of all, probably 19% of 16-year-olds couldn't do any maths in 1955, and we've all forgotten that. And <coughs> secondly, actually, OK, given that, that, you know, and it's also not true, but, you know, given that it's the case, it's a complex business, how are we going to sort it out, isn't it? And it's not actually, a lot of these issues are cultural. They're not down to teachers. We always get the blame, though. That much you can guarantee. <laughs> so anyway, but thanks for coming. And if you... I should introduce, so you know, Diana and Alison. Could you stand up? <laughs> Diana and Alison. Alison, Diana. <coughs> and they are the, you, the people you'll be talking to on Hamilton and emailing and who actually are send, doing all the hard work of sending out the books and the booklets and numbers. So if you get your numbers in, they will send you the booklets. Is that right? Yeah. I think most people have, actually. Well, we are looking into that. Okay. okay. That'd be brilliant. And we're hoping that the test will be, the test will probably be ready to go by the end of this week and we'll send the site over, but certainly by next week. So then we'll send it to you. There, one thing I should have said, there's a number game, a bonds game, which is like a computer game. <coughs> well, what do I mean like? It is a computer game and it's a real, um, you know, it's not, it's not actually shooting, it's popping, it's shooting balloons. So it's kind of, Okay, um, but effectively you're shooting and it depends upon being really good at computer skills, which I am not, and really good at your number bonds, which I am. So I managed to get an average score, but only by being really good at the numbers and really rubbish at the, at the arrow keys. But kids who are really good at the computer bit can get equal score, even when they're not quite as good as the numbers. But it's number bonds, basically number bonds to 20, so things like 7 and 8. You know, six and nine. And you've got to be quick to get them down. It's really good fun. It's rather compulsive, especially for maths teachers. Because <laughs> to get a gold, you've got to be pretty good. But we will be putting that on the site. And we'd really love your pupils to play it. And we're thinking of offering some prizes for the pupils you feel did best at it. So, I mean, as in cash prizes. So... I'll put it up on the site and then you'll be hearing from us about it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks very much. Thank That's all right. Much. No worries. <laughs>